Well, so far we have moved from not knowing what the brain does to at least some knowledge of the brain. And I am sure that you have been looking at your handouts and going through the readings that have been assigned and the references that have been given for the courses. And the lessons 1 to 5 uh, that we have done so far, I hope that you will look into it, read it, understand it because without reading and without understanding and let me add another thing which I tell my students, without observing of what you have read and thinking about it, similarly observing and understanding what has happened and lo even looking within yourself because you are a product of what the functioning of the brain has been and is been happening. I would suggest first of all that you read, you understand, observe people around you, animals around you and you will see similarities. We will be talking about the biological basis of behavior today. But before I do that, let me recap what we have done before. We have recapped at least lesson 1 and lesson 2 before. Lesson 3 and 4 that we did the last time, just remember we talked about methodologies, we talked about techniques, we talked about the various disciplines and the sub-disciplines and the sub-specialities that come within the scope of behavioral neuroscience. Also, I talked specifically about the magic of scientific method, how it is logical, analytical and at the same time it gives you the best findings, simple yet enormous potential for getting the results. Now, let me recap just a little the scientific methodology. You must remember this is part of your life now. Scientific method begins with observation and ends with observation, simple as that. But in between this observation, there is the development of conjectures, of hypotheses, of formulating theories and then going and developing experiments for testing those theories, conjectures, hypotheses. Again, where do you do that? You go back, you experiment and you observe and you verify or do not verify. The results are there, the facts speak for themselves as we say. So, when the facts do not support your conjectures, you go back and modify your thing and your hypothesis. And I say, for example, because the clouds are in this form and this, and I can say this, and my grandmother has many hypotheses, and I say, no, grandmother, you are wrong. She says, it will rain because I tell you, I can feel it in my bones. I say, no, the science does not say so. The clouds have to be a certain shape and a certain form before the rain can come. And therefore, we both test our hypothesis, the rain comes or does not come, it supports my hypothesis or my grandmother's. That is how conjectures are then verified by the observations and the facts and the happenings. Having said that, let me say within knitted within this system of observation and verification and conjecture is that fine tuning by the logic. And I remember I told you the hyp hypotheses are formulated on the basis of deductive logic and on the basis of inductive reasoning. So, both these methods knitted work very well together and I gave you an example of Darwin enormous potential of his work was brought together by the inductive reasoning. Suffice it to say that this is all that I will talk about on the scientific method, but keep that in the back of your mind because everything that we are going to be talking about in this course is scientific method only. Let me show you a few pictures of what this scientific method and the experiments and the 
research techniques that we had seen. There is one picture of a very nice experiment in psychophysiology. Remember we talked about psychophysiology in this particular experiment where there are scalp recordings being done of this particular patient subject and this is one of those subjects. There were four different groups. Remember I said there is a control group two on which the basis of the findings can be made. So, that is the base. The control is a base one control subject normal subject and three groups of schizophrenics were taken in this particular experiment and their uh, visual recording eye movements were taken at the same time excuse me at the same time the recordings were made in the brain. So, visual tracking at the same time brain manipulations and the changes in the brain when the scanning is being done by the eye what happens how do they perceive and the resultant. So, three experimental groups one control group visual tracking at the same time using psychophysiological methods and this is one very good example this is in your textbook and I hope that you get to see it and read what this experiment was all about. There is another experiment that I would like to show you and this is if you remember I was talking about cognitive neurosciences. In cognitive neurosciences the brain scan is used and if you look very closely here is an area which is colored differently. Why is it colored differently? It tells the scientist, the neuroscientist that this is an area of the total brain which is most active at this point in time. So, whatever activity I am doing, if I am speaking, it will be the Broca's area. Remember we talked about Broca and if I am listening, it is going to be Wernicke's area. If I am picking things, it will be a motor area. So, whatever activity is being done can immediately be monitored and recorded using functional imaging of the brain. Functional means as the functions go on, the images can be made and recorded and activity noted. So, these were the two methods and I remember we talked about the different disciplines and the different methodologies that are being used. As you can see both of them have used the human subjects, both of them are non-invasive, they have not invaded the brain, they have not gone into the brain, but I will show you later on some experiments in animals where we have gone into the brain and made changes. Now, one thing which I told you last time and we talked about it, very important and I raised this issue of ethics. I raised this question of how we should not play with the brains because this is critical and I will just show you a picture of what Monet's the experiments that were done by Monet's were that the frontal lobotomy was done by inserting a scalpel a needle inside the brain and damaging that particular region. Now, this damage is forever therefore, there it is completely forbidden unless it, for experiments we cannot do something like that. In humans certainly impossible, but in animals we do have these condition which we fulfill and then we can do these experiments in animals. Okay, so ha having said that let us move on when we talk about humans and we talk about animals and we talk about the homo sapien as we know him and you and I are homo sapiens. What is this biological basis of behavior? Why biology? Remember the organism, the physiology is a biological system. The brain itself is a biological system, a living biological system. 
which operates on certain principles. And we as a being are a living organism within which there are many systems working. We like other animals are also genetically determined to a great extent. We will talk about that. So, in order to understand the brain behavior relationships, we need to understand the biological systems. In order to understand the biological systems, let us for our convenience divide it into two major biological systems that we need to understand. First, the evolution of the homo sapien and other animals on the phylogenetic scale. To understand how the brain influenced behavior and how behavior influenced the development of the brain, the evolutionary development of the brain. How the brain as it evolves changes behavior and how behavior changes as the brain evolves. So, there is an interaction of both brain and behavior and this interaction developed about millions of years of evolution to the point that we are the homo sapien. So, evolution study of evolution gives us an understanding of what and how the brain developed into what it is. Secondly, the biological system, we are all biological systems. The biological systems within us are coded, genetically coded. So, we need to understand how behavior is affected by these genetic codes, if it is affected by genetic codes. There are similarities within the programs. There are differences within the programs as we stand a living organism as compared to other organisms. So, we will be studying essentially two different biological basis of behavior divided into evolution of the brain and behavior and the second is genetic basis of behavior. When we talk about the evolution, you must understand and I keep repeating it again that it is the homo sapien that we are talking about. We are no longer human beings, forget. In this course, we think about us as homo sapien. The homo sapien on the face of this earth is a comparatively very new species. We evolved around, the homo sapien evolved around not more than 50,000 years ago between 100,000 years to 50,000 years and compare us with the millions of years over which animals have been evolving. Now, the Homo sapien has very distinct characteristics which differentiate the Homo sapien from other animals. Think about it. What do we have which is different? from the primates, from the lions, from the cats, from the monkeys, what do we, what is it different? How do I see, how do you see me standing upright? Do you see me walking upright? So, the first and the foremost difference that we have between the homo sapien and other animals is the upright walk. The upright walk distinguishes us for many reasons and I will, we will talk about this later and this is called bipedalism, walking on two feet. So, upright posture and bipedalism looks very easy, but if you look at the millions of years that have gone from changing us from this point to straighten up like this, that is evolution, a very distinct evolution. Then language, I speak, as I speak, I use my vocal cords, air is pushed out and I use my muscle, the face muscles and 
suppose the question that you have in your mind is, animals also have a language. Birds also have songs. They talk to each other. Yes, they do. But do they have this very intricate, integrated system which communicates and which has many intonations? Their language, their communication is simpler. And we have a very complex language full of grammar and full of um, syntaxes and connotations, meanings, extremely complex. So, think about how language, when it was developing, could have influenced the development and vice versa of the brain. It is learnt, certainly, you, nobody is born with a language. As soon as a neonate is born, it can be taught French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, wherever it is born, it is taught that language. And there is the system is receptive. So, we, the bird is born with this apparatus and it can sing the chirp at the time of the, as a maturity. But the human has to learn to speak the kind of language. And you remember the first word when the baby says, Amma, Ma, Mother, Mama, that is when everybody says, ah, he is learning. So, the language has to be learned. Then, if you look at the human society, look at your society. Look at, if you read about the primitive societies in social psychology. Look at the primitive tribes, look at the tribal systems, not just here, but across the world, in different cultures, in Africa, in South, Far East Asia, in South Asia. There is a very distinct hunter-gatherer role. The male, the hunter, the female, the gatherer. So there is a division of the male-female roles which have been knit in through the biological evolutions. And we are going to talk about how this happened and why this happened in the later part of the book. Then there is another which happens in other animals also, where other animals use. Sociobiologists say that other animals use slaves to do their work. But the Homo sapien is the only animal which has domesticated other animals for its own use. The dog to protect you, the horse to bear you, your burden the cow for milk and so on and so forth and sheep for meat, you know, you name it and you've got these specializations all cut out. The homo sapien therefore has taken the specialized ability of the animals, of the lower animals and used it for his benefit or her benefit. So, as a society, has evolved, the human has evolved, there is therefore the domestication and the greater domestication of the animals and specialized animals at that. Then what do we have next? Look around you. Extremely complex societies. Yes, ants also have their ant hills in which there are systems, the queen ant and the uh, worker ants and so on and so forth, the fighter ants. The bees also have their hives in which they have these animals. The queen bee sits and uh, the rest of the worker ants and the, the, there is a system within that. In the same way, the primates has a system, the alpha male rules. And then there are males who are lowest on the rung, so the last uh, primate monkey to eat when everybody else has eaten. So, there is certainly an order of sociological and social uh, systems as well. But none compares to what we have in the human societies. In the human societies, we have a highly evolved and a highly complex societal system 
highly complex cultures where we have traditions, religions, so on and so forth, customs and these are passed on from one generation to another. Let me add another which sociobiologists have identified and this is a distinct characteristic of the homo sapien only. The homo sapien is the only species on the face of this earth that will kill its own species without any specific survival purpose. Remember animals combat because of survival needs, but homo sapien is the only species on the face of this earth which does not need this combat at this survival need to be fulfilled, kill only for the sake of killing. And some say that lions do not kill without need because there is an internal mechanism to stop them from killing. Perhaps homo sapien has lost that internal mechanism, but that is aside from that. Another very distinct characteristic for the homo sapien it is a highly evolved abstract thinker. This homo sapien is the one in the primitive systems developed tools from stones and then evolved to using iron, wood and so on and so forth. So the tool use is the homo sapiens speciality. Of course, there have been some findings which have shown Jane Goodall and others, that chimpanzees also use tools in a primitive form, but not of the form of shaping rocks to cut, to scrape or to uh, clean for so and so forth, which was found in the primitive uh, caves where man, a homo sapien lived. Also very distinct is that there was art in the primitive caves. Where the primitive man or the homo sapien lived. So, art, tool shaping, abstract thinking uh, and also in some way some researchers uh, have found some basic religion as well. For whatever region, whatever religion that was, but there were some customs like placing the goat's head on the, the head end of the grave etc. etc. So, these are, these are things that were found which indicated, this evidence indicated that there was some form of religion as well. However, having said all these things, let me still state that the homo sapien is similar to other biological species. Now, let us look at this picture and that will give you an idea of what similarities I am talking about. These similarities are on the type of, uh, if you see, there are two very distinct, very interesting pictures. One, where you see different primates and you can see the primate which is not upright to the animals which have now started being upright. To the point where we have the homo sapien completely upright. We also have a very interesting picture which will show you that this is the human hand and the human foot and this is a primate hand and a primate foot. Very interesting. You see how we have evolved and we have evolved differently. But at the same time, look the similarity, the hand and the foot have something in similar with that of the primate. Of course, there are four fingers, one thumb, four fingers, one thumb and of course the foot, even though it does not really look like this foot, is a foot which has a ball on which the animal can stand. But the difference that you see is what we are going to be talking about a little later. Now, if you look at 
how we are similar? We are similar because we follow fall in the animal kingdom. There is a classification system that has been developed in the biological sciences long time ago and we will just go over it quickly for your benefit so that you understand. First of all, there is the kingdom which encompasses all living animals and the kingdom that we have, we belong to is that of animalia. The phylum is the second classification which is a little more specific. So, we are going from general to very specific. So, it is like encompassing everything and then coming down to specifics. Phylum, we belong, the homo sapien belongs to the chordata phylum. Now, what is this chordata? C H O R D A T A, chordata phylum. Chordata phylum is those groups of animals who have a notochord. A notochord during the evolution or the developmental phases, the notochord is the nerve cord. The nerve cord which formulates the part of the brain and the spinal cord. Of course, during early evolution, they also had pharyngeal gill slits, which you see in the fishes still, and that is what we have. The subphylum that the Homo sapien belongs to, further specialization is that of vertebra. Of course, put your hand to your back and you feel your vertebral column, right? We all have one, otherwise, you would not be standing upright or otherwise we would not be able to support the weight that we carry. So, the vertebral column which protects your spinal cord also is the subphylum that we belong to as homo sapien. The class that we belong to is mammalia. Of course, there are other classes and you if you have studied biology you know the avian, the avians the reptilians, amphibians and so on and so forth, many, 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 many different classes. We are distinct because we are mammalians who have the mammillary glands and this, these mammalians, we are similar to other mammalians, primates are also mammalians and there are other mammalians who are similar to us, but they are they belong to different orders, families, genus and species. Next comes the classific the order to which we belong. The order is you can be carnivorous, meat eating or herbivorous, uh, eating grass and herbs and plants and trees, you know, branches, they are animals, even like the koala bear next to is the eucalyptus trees, leaves of eucalyptus. So, there are herbivorous, carnivorous, lion is carnivorous, a horse is herbivorous and where do we stand? We are omnivorous. We eat both meat as well as, unless by choice you are a vegetarian, you eat meat as well as herbs and the the, the plants and the fruits and so on and so forth. So, as in the order that we are, we are omnivorous. The family that we belong to, now we are further specializing. We are different from other animals. We are very, very specialized now. A very specific group and that family is the family of the hominoids. Hominoids are those primates to which classification we belong. And of course, there are the dogs belong to the canine family, the canids, the cats belong to the felid family, the felines and the cats are the lion is a cat and so is the domesticated house cat or the Siamese cat and so on and so forth. The range of felids, the wolf is a can, uh, canid and uh, the house dog is a, a canid. And we are hominoids. We share this with the primates, the higher order primates. The genus, again, we go a little more specific. The genus 
we belong to is hominids. And then lastly very specialized, very specific is the species that we belong to. We belong to the homo sapiens species that we have been talking about earlier. So, the homo sapien is similar to all animals because it is in the kingdom of animalia. It is similar to a large number of animals who have caudatas or the notochord, similar to mammalians, different from the birds and the reptiles and the amphibians. We are omnivorous, we are hominoids, hominids and then homo sapiens. Now, after having said this, let me take you to a journey and let us see how we have, this is what I have described earlier as species is basic to classifying animals. Very clear difference between species. The dog is different from the wolf and within the cat family there is also differences. Within the primate family, the homo sapien is different from the chimpanzee and the rhesus monkey and the orangutan and the gorilla, you name it and we are different. We look different, we act different and we have got different behaviors. All this is a division on a phylogenetic scale. The phylogenetic scale is a scale which is ordered in terms of the differential characteristics that animals have. When we are talking about species specific and species which are different from each other, there are several things that make a spe one species different from the other. First of all, the difference in appearance, difference in shape and difference in form. Take these three differences in the beginning and let me give you an example or three examples. The horse, the zebra and the donkey, they all belong to the same genus, but there are three different species. These are equus, but they are different. The horse you can distinctively differentiate from the zebra and distinctively dis differentiate from the donkey. Now when they are different, you can immediately say this is a horse, but at the same time you see the similarities because they belong to a, a sim similar genus. Their behaviors are different, behavior has to be different between species. All three are herbivorous, that is a similarity, but within the three, the horse, the zebra, and the donkey. The horse is more territorial. Territorial means it protects its territory. It will fight for its territory. And the horse like the zebra runs in packs, in groups, where there is one alpha male, the leader of the pack. So there is very interesting similarities and differences even in behaviors. Remember, the rule of nature is that the species do not interbreed. One species will not crossbreed with another. Now, if we do crossbreed, man does strange things. Crossbreeding is not beneficial for either species. But if we do crossbreed, we get an ass, a mule. A mule, a horse and an ass, we get a mule and a mule is sterile. Have you heard of ligers, a lion and a tiger mated together? That will be a sterile, which means there is no further propagation of the gene pool or the genetic material. It cannot go any further. The animal is not capable of propagating further. So therefore, nature has put in a cap there that animals from bit different species do not uh, crossbreed or do not interbreed. What else differentiates these species? 
the species differentiated in terms of behavior, in terms of terrain, in terms of uh, the, the distinctive characteristics. So, there is even within the species very distinct differences and as I said before, if you look at the homo sapien, how it was different from um, the other primates that we belong to. How does this concept of moving from one species to another or sorry not one species to another, but from one form to another, how does this evolve? The evolution, the theory of evolution that was given by everyone knows Charles Darwin, but in the background let us say there was an evolution of the theory of evolution. It began and there may be have many more contributors, but on record we have Linnaeus was the first one to state that all animals on the face of this earth were one act of creation and the fee, then part of these, his theory was that the species are fixed when they are created, they are unchanging, the species cannot change, they are fixed forever. However, there is a contradiction. He said within the species there is variation which is possible. So, one horse is a little different from the other horse. Having said that, he also said that each species is independent like we said before that the horse, the donkey and the zebra are independent species. So, that there is a contradiction if the species are unchanging, then why this variation that he proposed within the species? And how do these, these variations, what is to account for these variations? Well, that is a philosophical discussion, we will not go into it now, right now. The second name that comes in is Comte Georges de Buffon, 1707 to 1788. He proposed a very interesting concept. He said, well, there is evolution, there is change and this change occurs in a different direction. He called it degeneration. He said the ass is the degenerate horse. So, evolution is in the process of degenerating. So, we start off with the superior most and then come to the degenerate. Monkey is the degenerate of man. So, there is a concept the first and the foremost thing that you must remember at that he introduced the concept of change in the species. Now, in this concept of change, there are several things that he said play a role in this change. First, the effect of the environment. The environment pressurizes the de degeneration. The forces of migration, when animals move from one place to another, from one location to another, from one kind of climate to another, there is this possibility of change. Then environmental variation, the environment does not remain the same. As I said, there is climatic variation, cold, very cold, hot, extremely hot, humid. So, there is the sea, the land, the mountains, so there is variation. And then he talked about the most critical concept which is that animals are struggling for existence. The animal kingdom, there is a, there is a constant battle within the species to exist and these are the concepts that we later see Darwin using in his theory. And Darwin very beautifully laid out, used the concepts that are already laid out by others. And then we have another addition which is what also Darwin utilized 
the Lamarckian theory. The Lamarckian theory, or Lamarck, of course, Lamarck is the one who proposed, wherever we call it the Lamarckian theory, 1744 to 1829, he produced a remarkable book called Philosophie Zoologique. And this Philosophie Zoologique had a concept of transmutation that animals are constantly in a state of flux to change and they are changing for the better. They are being perfected. How does that happen? He did give uh, a proposal. He said that a direction of change, remember earlier the direction of change was degeneration. But now he proposed direction of change is upward and this he called the ladder of life that every animal species moves up into perfecting its forms to a higher form. And that Lamarckian, Lamarckian change moving of upwards however has another aspect to it. He said, well, when you moved up, you die, you come back and join the ladder of life by regenerating in a different way. So, material never dies, it absorbs and becomes a part of another life, goes on. Interesting concepts, but the interesting, most interesting concept is that there is a change and there is a constant change. So, change is not fixed. The organism is not fixed at any point in time, it is changing. Then, he talked about the environmental pressures to change, that the environment pressurizes the organisms to change the shape and the form and behavior. Also, he talked about small heritable units which are changed within one generation which means that these can be passed on later. This concept remains here and we will see that this come back again at another point in time by another it is brought in again by another theorist. Another concept which is very important is he talks about how organs grow with use and shrink with disuse. Think about it. If you do not walk and you stop using your legs, what will happen? Perhaps we are going to lose our legs. And if we use our head and our brain, so oh, this brain will grow. And if you have seen science fiction movies, especially the Star Trek, you will see where they have this uh, captain's uh, ship, Star Trek ship going into this uh, universe where they, there was humans or whatever form with huge brains, but very little feet and hands. Perhaps that is uh, out of these uh, theories that the concept of science fiction developed. But also think that we are using computers all the time, perhaps our fingers will get evolved into a different form as well. So, Lamarckian concepts were interesting concepts. Lamarck talked about possibilities and he said that the organism talks, uh, expands the possibilities. Each organism has the capacity to expand the possibilities. Experience counted, environment made a difference. So, the theory of use and disuse was then incorporated within his, his concepts as well. Then came Lysenko who built on Lamarckian theory and he gave the concept of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, this was dramatic that whatever experiences you have, I have within this generation is can be passed on immediately to the next generation through genetic material very dramatic, not possible, but there are people who stand by this 
even today that there are, is a possibility of uh, passing on uh, uh, inheriting and passing on uh, characteristics that are required in one generation. Then comes to, to cap it all Darwin in from between 1809 to 1882 is the time period. Darwin very interesting man is doing his studies at the University of Edinburgh quite bored did not like what he was studying. So, there was this HMS his Maj Her Majesty's ship Beagle which was leaving for the voyages to explore the oceans and the continents. So, he joined that ship and he traveled with that ship he did not have to pay big men I mean they did not pay him for it, but he just joined that ship and took his notebook along. They landed at the Galapagos island and for 22 years he went kept going back again and again. He made meticulous notes of what he saw on the Galapagos island. The Galapagos islands are isolated islands. And very isolated in the uh, in the sense that only the ships could get there, and it was a long distance to fly there as well. What he noted was there were similarities. Let's say the birds. There were similar kinds of birds on the seashore, on the cliffs, on the trees, in the mainland. There were similarities, but there were also differences that the birds on the sea had evolved those feet, the flapper feet by which they could swim. The birds on the mountains had developed beaks which could then get into the rock to get food out. So, the survival these then differentiated because perhaps there was one or two birds or a flock of birds which were similar which arrived on this, uh, this island and then evolved in different ways in different forms to different territories and different terrains and different parts of that island. Very interesting. So, that is remember I said inductive method is what he used. So, he proposed he draw this conclusion that the diversity and variation in related species is similar and this diversity and similarities increase with difference, the greater the difference, the greater the diversity. The greater the difference uh, distance, the greater the differences in appearance, in behavior, in the development and the growth of the species. Now, he also took on the concept which I earlier proposed that organisms vary and this variation is then inherited and this variation is then worked upon by the organism, the environment in which this organism is surviving. He also proposed that there is a natural overproductive tendency for all animals, but at the same time to balance it nature is always beautifully balanced. There is a tendency to maintain a constant population. Now, this is a very interesting concept where there is propagation, multiplication and enormous growth, but at the same time the, there is the tendency to keep the population constant. Of course, we understand the population will remain constant because of the resources. And because of the resources comes another concept. The resources is when animals have to fight for the same resources. They have to compete for the same resources. They have to compete for whatever is available. Therefore, there is a struggle for existence. And this struggle for existence, there are some who will win and some who will lose. And 
Darwin proposed, the winners are, the survivors are, those who have even the slightest biological advantage, not political, slightest biological advantage. They have the best chances of survival and therefore, they can continue to propagate their genes and continue to propagate their species for further. Some total. According to Darwin, best adapters are best reproducers, best reproducers are best hit and best survivors therefore. And this he called essentially a struggle for existence through natural selection. Natural selection means nature itself pressurizes organisms to adapt to survive and those organisms that or those animals that can adapt, can continue to reproduce are the best fit to survive. Therefore, we have so far talked about Darwin's principle of natural selection and we will talk about it later. Do read whatever you can on the net, do read the picture, the, the book Pinel and also I would suggest that if you can watch natural, natural um, National Geographic, extremely important because it gives you a perspective that you have uh, not had before. Look at animals and see how they are working and see how they are similar and see how they have evolved.